Hello, and welcome to another episode of Ask a Pianist. My name is Andrew Ahrens, and today we'll be discussing an interesting problem that comes up quite frequently in works of Bach. In many ways, Bach's scores are nightmarish to interpret. There are usually no dynamic markings, his tempo markings are a few and far between, and overall there is little to no indication about what he would like in terms of character or atmosphere. From another perspective, however, this means that his pieces are nearly completely open for interpretation. Sure, we have to try to cultivate ideas from clues that he leaves in the score, but the limits of interpretation are not at all clearly defined. So, we're thrown in the deep end when we try to learn and interpret a piece by Bach that is new to us. With Bach fugues, we at least have the comfort of working in a rather standardized structural model. Certain musical events happen in roughly the same order across nearly all fugues, and his approaches to voicing and texture are, for the most part, reasonably predictable, and thus reliable. Therefore, we can concentrate on aesthetic issues which are entirely up for grabs. In this episode, I'm going to talk about some common techniques and approaches which are helpful in determining what your final interpretation of a Bach fugue may be, or at least, what it may not be. There's a wonderful fugue by Bach in the opening movement of the Sixth Partita. I believe the first consideration should be regarding our tempo, as this directly affects the character and pacing of the piece, and thus will affect our choices in terms of sound quality, voicing, and other things like pedaling and articulation. In this fugue, like in many others by Bach, there is no firm value set on tempo. We really just estimate, or guess at a range, that appears performable, and we choose something within this. We could go a little faster. circumstances, the time signature can inform us if a piece is generally fast or slow. In this particular case, Bach has established cut time, so ideally we'd feel the pulse as two to a bar. This in itself would encourage a rather fast tempo, and in fact it would create quite a different character to the rather somber interpretation I presented earlier.
how do we determine what may be the best approach to our tempo selection? There are several factors. Usually, the time signature gets quite a lot of weight in terms of informative value, because it gives us an indication of how many pulses a bar should contain. If we play this fugue at a slow, somber pace, then we inevitably end up with four beats to the bar instead of two, even if we try very hard not to emphasize these beats. To make matters more complex, there are points in the fugue where Bach moves through harmonic progressions at the rate of a quarter note rather than a half. This further reinforces the feeling of four to a bar. If we do the opposite and play this fugue fast enough to give the impression of two pulses to a bar, then we run the risk that the music itself seems like it's going too fast for its own good. This issue of feeling actually stems from one of the clues we usually use when determining tempo. Note values can give us indications of boundaries of tempo within works, but in truth, much of the concern surrounds the fastest tempo, and not the slowest that one can play. To determine this upper limit in Bach, you simply have to take the shortest note value and experiment with it to find the fastest tempo in which these note values clearly communicate their pitch or articulation. The second parameter after note value is the rate of harmonic change. If Bach tends to change harmonies every quarter beat at the fastest, as opposed to every eighth beat, then as a performer, you know that you need to play slow enough that these changes are not obliterated and that they can be heard within reason by your audience. Usually this determination leads to a slower tempo than the one indicated by the upper limit of performing the note values themselves. The final step involves bringing pulse into the mix. Normally, the pulse tends to match or approach this tempo that was gleaned from the harmonic change, but this is precisely where our problems happen to be in this particular fugue. The pulse seems to indicate a very fast tempo, but the harmonic change and the material itself seem to indicate something quite slow. So, what do we do? With this kind of impasse, we almost have no choice but to consider extra musical context. In Bach, the gesture of a falling second is perhaps one of the most explicit and obvious indicators of sadness. He uses this everywhere, in the B minor mass, in the Goldberg variations, and other pieces which include heavy movements which border on despair. Though it may seem an obvious observation to make, a piece that is sad is usually not very fast. If we follow the tradition and give the falling second the emotional content it may deserve, then we are in fact coerced into playing this work not in two, but in four. this is actually a very slow two. But in practical terms, no audience member would ever think this is an absurdly slow two instead of a normal four. So this is the concession we might make here. Just for the sake of argument though, I'd like to play the opening of this fugue in a very fast four, or reasonable two. The character will be different, but surprisingly, the music doesn't fail. <laughs>
The freedom of interpretation that Bach allows is not only due to his lack of markings in his scores, but also because his music is, for the most part, completely reliant on counterpoint and harmonic change. You can remove his gestures, his articulations, and his ornaments, and the music still survives intact in a powerful way. You can play his music very slow or very fast. You can transcribe it to other instruments or voice combinations. You can do anything to his music, and it still communicates. Not so with other composers. With Chopin, if you remove his trills and ornaments, the phrase doesn't work. If you transcribe Beethoven to other instruments, instrument-specific gestures are lost or become confusing. With Bach, you have nearly pure abstract music. This is why the fugue still works at a faster tempo. Sure, it's a different character, but there's no concrete reason why it cannot be that way. What this means, of course, in the grand scheme of things, is that every interpretational decision we make when playing Bach could potentially, and sometimes easily, be refuted by a different perspective. In order to make sure our own interpretation works well, our goal must be to create an interpretation that is cohesive, with each vector of interpretation integrated in a logical and clear manner. I'll get back to this in a moment. Let's continue on with building our interpretation. For the moment, let's stick with the slower interpretation. Once we've decided on a tempo, then really we've also decided on the parameters of an emotional atmosphere. Now the question becomes, how do we phrase our fugue subject? As there are no slurs on the fugue subject at all, we can articulate this any way we choose. All legato. All staccato. And of course, something in between. We cannot add slurs or detached notes at random, however. The articulation decisions all depend on the rhythmic structure of the phrase. For instance, if you are going to do a two-note slur, for the majority of the time in Bach, you will have the first note on the beat so that the slur would create a natural emphasis or accent on the beat as opposed to off. It's a rare thing in Bach where he slurs off the beat. If you do this, you must be aware that it is a rare thing. And you must also remember to reset the beat patterns before the phrase finishes, like this. When it comes to detached notes, the common procedure is to detach longer notes. In this case, the eighth notes at the end of the fugue subject. This is not something I would recommend here, however, though I am aware it is a common interpretation of this particular fugue. Here's why. The last eighth notes of the fugal theme confirm the key and set up the next segment of the phrase, so to rob these notes of sound by cutting them short actually hinders your interpretation later on. This is assuming, of course, that you intend to perform every fugue subject with the same articulation as you started in the opening. These notes are exceedingly important. On their own, we can be creative, of course. But when we have situations, like in bar 42, where the fugue theme serves as the harmonic bass line, we end up cutting off our own legs by playing staccato the most important part of the fugue theme in terms of harmony. I'll play it slowly so you can hear what I mean. In 
the left hand, we need this bass. This supports everything that is happening over it. This isn't the only case where the fugue theme is in the bass and serves as a harmonic foundation. It happens surprisingly often in this fugue, including the final powerful statement of this theme. If you decide, however, that you'd like to do this, then there is a way around it. The convenience of the piano is that it allows us to differentiate individual voices by dynamics and sound coloration, and in a fugue, we have to use these tools to an extreme degree. Articulating notes in a detached manner accents them rhythmically, but diminishes them harmonically. So in order to counteract this, you'd be forced into playing these notes simply louder. So, to have the fugal theme played with the last notes detached would require you to play them quite loud any time they serve as a harmonic underpin. It's not ideal, but it's necessary harmonically, if you choose to play them detached at all. So, let's take stock of what we have so far. A decision has been made regarding the tempo, overall character of the fugue, and what one can do with the fugue subject in terms of articulation and slurs. Now it's necessary to build the fugue using these constants as guideposts. Before we continue, I would like to address a subject I had mentioned earlier, about creating an interpretation that is cohesive, where the vectors of interpretation are well integrated. This is perhaps even more important in Bach than in any other composer, for a very simple reason. Bach gives us music which is exceedingly well constructed. For the most part, his keyboard works are very efficient in their use and development of musical material. There is no waste. What we add as pianists to his music, whether it be dynamics or sound quality change or articulation and rhythmic emphasis, Whatever it is, it must attain the same level of compositional integrity that Bach reaches with his notes and counterpoint. If it does not, then we as listeners recognize the incongruity in quality level, and the interpretation decision which is faulty, or not well crafted, sticks out like a sore thumb. After deciding upon the overall character of the fugue, and how we want to play the fugal subject, we have to determine how we want to structure the fugue in terms of drama. There are no set rules about this, but given the common structure of Bach's fugues, I think there are certain elements that we can discuss here that are nearly foolproof. First, Bach will always state his fugue theme in each voice at the very beginning, so already we'll have a first section. of some kind before the final statement of the fugue theme. These two points are obviously important in terms of structure, and they both can be interpreted in a similar manner. You simply build them towards the end, getting louder and more present in each case. In between the opening and ending of the fugue, you really are at the mercy of Bach's creativity. What you have to do is determine what the high and low points are within this development section. There are several vectors which you can look at. First, consider the harmonic layout of the piece. Not in terms of bar-by-bar -bar harmonic progressions, but more from the perspective of large cadences. In Bach, cadences are used as signposts which delineate sections of music, which may differ from each other in terms of key, character, texture, and counterpoint. This goes hand-in-hand -hand with the rhythm, actually, 
because having Bach and a cadence on a main beat as opposed to a half beat gives more power to this particular cadence. As an example, his transition to D major for a moment begins on a half bar, but one may not perceive this cadence as being particularly eventful given the rhythm, texture, and continuity of gesture. It's almost as if he simply ends up there due to relaxing the situation. The polar opposite of this is what happens in the lead-up to bar 67, where Bach drives towards a cadence in A minor, even using the fugue theme to help us get there. I'll give you the entire section so that you can hear the length of the build-up to this point. Constructing your fugue, you have to consider these different approaches to cadences, because these will tell you which ones are important and which ones are not. Furthermore, there is usually one particular cadence which is the most important of all, and you must make sure that it is built through dynamics and sound quality appropriately. Not only do you have to consider the harmonic build-ups, but also you have to consider one of the more obvious indications of change, that of range and register on the keyboard. In Bach, there is a very natural approach to dynamics, in that if a gesture is rising, you can get louder, and if it's going lower in the keyboard, you can get softer. This works very well in passages like this one, where we get louder. in this one too, where we can get softer. This tactic, however, doesn't apply to everything. Given the range and texture, it probably makes sense to get louder as we approach the bottom of the keyboard in bar 71, to take advantage of the large sonority. This tactic can be used to surprise a listener by reversing the expectation, getting softer in a place that seems to be increasing in terms of stress and drama. You have to use this device carefully and with consideration to your other vectors. In part one of fugues, I discussed the voicing considerations we have with all fugues in terms of bringing out the fugue subject above all else. The decisions we make regarding the voicing of our fugues is the final step, actually, although most of these later steps are interchangeable in terms of when we apply them in our learning process. Either way, if you take all these ideas into consideration and build your fugue with integrity at every step, then you'll have an interpretation which is powerful and, on the first listen, seemingly infallible. You want it to sound like a monument to great composition, and the best compliment you can get from an audience member is that it was an awesome piece by Bach rather than an awesome performance by you. If you can construct your interpretation so well that it seems like this is the only way the piece can be played, then you've accomplished your job. So, that's it for this episode of Ask a Pianist. Until next time, keep practicing, and take time when you are constructing your fugues. If your decisions are well integrated, then you are free to do as you'd like. Bye for now.